So let's start. Um, right, so Asalaamu Alaikum everyone and uh, uh, welcome to part two of this webinar series, a case-based discussion on PD in Pakistan, which is organized in collaboration with the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. My name is Ahad Kayyum and I'm a consultant nephrologist at Beria Town International Hospital, Lahore. It is my utmost privilege and honor to welcome you and thank and introduce our local and focal, uh, and focal uh, uh, panelists and speakers for this webinar. Starting off with Professor Edwina Brown, who is the president-elect of the ISPD and chairs the ISPD Guidelines Committee. She currently works as a professor of nephrology at Imperial College London. She has been instrumental in organizing this webinar and has always been too kind in organizing such events for Pakistan. Professor Fred Finkelstein needs no introduction whatsoever. Apart from serving as chair of the ISPD International Liaison Committee, he also served as chair of the Peritoneal Dialysis Committee of the ISN. He is a professor of medicine at Yale Medical School USA and is a mentor to most, if not all, in attendance at this webinar. Professor Isaac Teitelbaum, who will join us shortly, similarly has been absolutely pivotal in organizing this event, and I doubt this webinar would have been possible without his support and guidance. He is a professor of medicine and nephrology at the University of Colorado and is the current chair of the International Liaison Committee of the ISPD. Moving on to Dr. Adrian Liu, who serves as a senior consultant nephrologist and associate professor of medicine with the LKC School of Medicine in Singapore. Due to Dr. Liu has contributed immensely to the ISPD guidelines on PD prescription, which he will be speaking on later on in the webinar. He is an elected, elected executive and secretary of the ISPD. I, on, on behalf of the organizing committee, must voice a special thank you to him for his generosity and accepting to be a part of this webinar, considering it is 1 a.m. in Sing Singapore as we, he joins us at this hour. We are truly humbled and thankful to you, Dr. Liu. I am honored to introduce Mr. Miguel Gallardo, who is the ISPD coordinator for all such events, who joins us from Brussels, Belgium. We are very thankful for him for helping us organize this webinar. Moving on to the local panelists, Professor Noman Tarif, who again needs no introduction. He serves as a professor of nephrology at Fatma Memorial Hospital, Lahore. Apart from being the co-founder of the PD Academy of Pakistan, he is the editor of Pakistan Journal of Kidney Diseases and recently concluded a very productive stint as general, general secretary of the Pakistan Society of Nephrology. Professor Ali Asghar Lainwala is a professor and head of Pediatric Nephrology at the Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplant in, in Karachi. He provides a very novel and distinct perspective because of him holding American boards in nephrology in both adults and pediatric populations. He serves as the current treasurer of the Pakistan Society of Nephrology. Professor Sayyid Munib is a professor of nephrology at the Institute of Kidney Disease Hayatabad in Peshawar, Pakistan. He is an avid supporter of PD and has published extensively on the state of PD in Pakistan. Dr. Kamar Khan, again, needs no introduction. He is an avid PD supporter and has remained the backbone of all PD initiatives in Pakistan for the past decade or so. He is a consultant nephrologist based in the Indiana in the United States and runs numerous philanthropic programs in Azad Kashmir, Pakistan. Our esteemed local speakers include Dr. Kiran Khushid, who, who joins us from the Shifa International Hospital in Islamabad, who is a consultant nephrologist after receiving her renal training from the University of Pittsburgh. She is a very passionate about peritoneal dialysis and has the maximum number of PD patients in Pakistan in her follow-up to date. Professor Shafiq Chima, again needs no introduction, is a professor of nephrology at the Ilama Iqbal Medical College, Lahore. He possesses a special interest in, promote, in promoting renal health awareness and has made various videos to promote and raise awareness of PD in Pakistan. Before we start, I would just like to remind the audience once again to please post your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat box. Our esteemed panelists, along with our facilitators, Dr. Mohsin Riaz and Dr. Faria Khalil, who will be monitoring uh, the Q&A box, and the questions will be taken up by the chairs of the various sessions. So without further ado, let's just jump into the scientific session with Dr. Kiran Khushid's presentation. Dr. Kiran? Assalamualaikum and good evening. My name is Dr. Kiran and uh, I'm a nephrologist in Islamabad. I will be talking to you about adequacy in peritoneal dialysis. And I will start with a case. 
Um, so this was a 51-year-old uh, freelance journalist uh, who was on hemodialysis uh, for two months and uh, he was not happy with it. He wanted uh, to be switched to peritoneal dialysis and um, his urine output was normal at that time. His past medical history was significant for uh, long-standing diabetes, nephrolithiasis, and he'd had an open cholecystectomy in the past. On physical examination, he was uh, normal tensive. Uh, he was of average uh, height and build, and he has minimal uh, volume overload. Um, so uh, we put a Tenkoff catheter in, and PAPD was started two weeks later on. On his uh, uh, next follow-up visit, uh, his appetite had greatly improved. His urine output had also increased compared to when he was on hemodialysis. Uh, he admitted to not being that compliant with his uh, medications, but he was doing his peritoneal dialysis exchanges regularly. Um, he was hypertensive and he had two plus edema. Um, for PD, he was doing four exchanges using two liter yellow bags. His ultrafiltration was 400 ml per day. His labs at that time were um, acceptable except for his albumin, which was on the lower side. And so I um, changed his prescription to four green bags that resulted in a UF of one liter per day. Um, he was lost to follow up for uh, about six months, came back in in September, and he said he felt great and had gone back to work, didn't feel the need to see a doctor on a regular basis. Uh, his urine output has decreased to 500 ml per day and uh, his hypertension was worse. Uh, he had gained weight as well. Um, on, uh, in terms of his uh, PD, he was using uh, four exchanges of green bags and his UF was two liters per day. Um, his uh, labs were only the creatinine bun and uh, hemoglobin. He said the rest of the labs were too expensive. So I um, added uh, red bags at nighttime for four days. I increased his antihypertensives and added Lasix. Um, so uh, he came back uh, for his next follow-up uh, visit next month. And at this time he had fever. He was diagnosed with dengue fever. He had become anuric. His blood pressure was somewhat better, uh, but he had gained a lot of weight. Um, he was uh, still using uh, four exchanges of uh, green bags and uh, he was using red bag one to twice a week, but he was not keeping track of his ultrafiltration. His labs at that time to me looked worse. Um, so I uh, advised him to avoid red bags and reiterated the need for compliance with treatment. Um, and he was told to follow up after a month. Um, along came COVID. I did not see him for six months. And then um, I got a teleconsultation uh, with the daughter in May 2020. And she said, father cannot move his limbs. He cannot even sit up with support. Um, I tried to talk to him and uh, he was slurring his words and his look, face looked pale and puffy. Um, they were doing three to four exchanges um, using green bags and said that the ultrafiltration was good but they did not provide me with any numbers. These were his labs. So to me, they looked uh, worse than before. And uh, we got neurology involved. He was diagnosed with Parkinsonism, started on Cinemed, and then his mobility, his swallowing uh, started to improve. So we uh, decided to monitor him for another month. So he didn't come back for the next uh, six months. And then in December, um, again, a teleconsultation with the daughter uh, said her father was uh, worse than before. He was too weak to talk, could barely walk a few steps, and uh, his appetite was fine. His blood pressure was fine. Uh, when I looked at him, to me, his, his face and feet looked more swollen. Uh, they were doing uh, four exchanges of uh, green bags uh, regularly but they were not uh, checking his ultrafiltration and they were not checking his blood pressure on a daily basis. Um, so these were, here was, uh, these were his labs in December and they looked worse than before. And um, 
since uh, the family had given me very little information, uh, it was hard to uh, understand whether it was his Parkinson's disease, his um, family neglect, or was it inadequate dialysis that was causing his general debility and uh, failure to thrive. So um, I decided to do a KT or recalculation, and these were his uh, labs. Um, on the day of uh, collection, uh, he had 800 ml uh, ultrafiltration, and uh, where his weekly KT or V came out to be 1.42. Now we understand this is way below our goal of uh, 1.7. Um, what is KT or V? It's the minimum amount of small mo uh, molecule clearance needed to achieve adequate dialysis. And uh, from uh, randomized control trials, we know that a KT over V less than 1.5 has a, a very high two-year mortality. We know from the ADAMX study that um, a KT over V of 1.7 is just as good as a KT over V of 2.0. And um, we also know that uh, albumin levels less than three have a poor prognosis. Another study from Turkey shows that uh, if the sodium clearance uh, in the dialysate is low or if uh, the total volume of the effluent is low, then uh, the patient has a poor prognosis. So rather than uh, measuring KT over V in every patient, I usually rely on what I call the surrogate markers of PD adequacy. And these are the patient's symptoms of uremia, uh, uncontrolled hypertension, volume overload, uh, the low albumin level, uh, hypokalemia, uh, higher than expected bicarb level, uh, low BON, low phosphorus, and uh, anemia. In uh, medicine, we've moved towards uh, patient-centered care. And in nephrology, uh, it is the same, uh, and we have moved towards goal-directed peritoneal dialysis. And uh, rather than just focusing on uh, ratio, we now uh, focus more on patients' nutritional status, their quality of life, their pre preservation of residual renal function, and also on an adequate KT relief. <laughs> In hindsight, what I could have done differently to provide this patient with adequate dialysis? Well, we could have taken steps to maintain his residual renal function, uh, provided better um, control of his blood pressure, uh, avoided a high uh, dextrose concentration dialysate. We could have increased the volume of the dialysate. I could have uh, monitored his KT over V uh, regularly. Mm. In an ideal world, um, I would have loved to do that, but ha having come back to Pakistan and uh, now working in a, um, a resource-limited uh, environment, uh, I've come across a few hurdles. And um, uh, the biggest one is the, uh, the cost to the patient. So uh, PD is not supported by the government and everything is out of pocket for the patient. If I do extra tests, that uh, means more cost to the patient. Uh, to be exact, an extra 2,000 rupees uh, per visit to the patient. Um, and then uh, a PD fluid comes in two liter bags only. So uh, if I need, want to increase the volume of dialysis, I need to increase the number of exchanges, uh, which is very cumbersome for the patient and their caregivers. It is time consuming. And if I do five or six exchanges, uh, that is time lost uh, uh, during dialysis exchanges. Um, uh, and uh, since we don't have automatic PD or Icotex strand, we have to uh, rely on uh, using uh, uh, red bags uh, to get ultrafiltration at times. Um, the other problem um, is sometimes the, the uh, 24 hour collections are inadequate. And uh, since it's expensive, I don't have the heart to tell the patient to perform it again. So with this, um, I'm uh, not saying that we should not do KT over B, 
but rather we should focus more on the surrogate markers and the general well-being of the patient and uh, try to provide them with adequate uh, EPD by adjusting their PD prescription. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kiran. Uh, that was pretty ins uh, very insightful. I think we will um, open it for discussion after Dr. Adrian Liu's talk. Um, and Dr. Adrian Liu's talk is on PD prescription in a resource-limited country. Uh, it's very pertinent to us and to the talk that um, Dr. Kiran has already uh, given right now. So I think we'll run um, Dr. Adrian Liu's talk first, and then we will open the forum for discussion. So thank you for involving me in this webinar, as well as the work on PD in Pakistan. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be highlighting some of the important issues with prescribing PD in a low resource setting. Uh, and we'll try to summarize some of the points in the recently published ICE PD guidelines on prescribing high quality and goal directed PD um, with relevance um, to low and middle income countries. The access to dialysis um, and the ability to continue dialysis in the presence of medical indications um, is a recognized challenge in many low income countries. Now in this paper by Gloria, focusing on the situation in Africa, more than 80% of incident patients um, stop dialysis even though it is needed, with less than 10% continuing dialysis treatment beyond three months, often due to the financial difficulties. Now, this situation is not uncommon in many other low-income countries uh, across the world, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. Consequently, peritoneal dialysis has become a much more attractive and cheaper option in providing kidney replacement therapy to ESKD patients in many low-income countries. Um, in this map, uh, for example, uh, in many Asia-Pacific countries, uh, you will notice that the provision of peritoneal dialysis uh, is cheaper compared to that of hemodialysis, um, suggesting that PD might become a much more viable option in ensuring uh, continuity of dialysis treatment for ESKD patients. But despite cost being a significant consideration to ensure the sustainability of dialysis treatment, uh, the provision of high quality dialysis as well as patient-centered treatment with good outcomes should not be compromised. Um, and maintaining such a balancing act uh, was one of the key aims uh, of the recent um, ISPD guidelines. Therefore, the approach to prescribing PD in a low resource setting can be summarized in three main strategies uh, listed here. The first is the use of incremental PD, uh, where the initial PD dose could be lower with the aim of stretching uh, the dialysis dollar for as long as possible. Um, the application of PD physiology also allows for more flexibility in the prescription to achieve much more optimal outcomes rather than a fixed um, and rigid approach. And finally, the focus on low cost measure may be just as effective in achieving the desired clinical outcomes um, rather than um, a premature intensification of the dialysis dose. Let's begin with incremental PD. Incremental PD takes into account the patient's residual kidney function and starts off with a much lower PD dose rather than the traditional four exchanges per day approach. Um, the number of PD exchanges is then increased in a stepwise manner as the residual kidney function declines so that consistent clearance and stable clinical outcomes can be achieved. In this single center cohort study of about 100 over patients, um, the authors defined incremental PD as patients who were receiving one to two exchanges per day on CAPD, whereas the standard PD consisted about three to four exchanges per day. Now, the authors found that in those patients who were receiving incremental PD, uh, they were able to maintain the residual kidney function to over um, the six months follow up period, uh, whereas those who were on standard PD had a decline in the uh, residual kidney function. 
Um, there were also fewer hospitalizations in those patients with incremental PD. And the survival uh, of the patients uh, was similar uh, in both groups. And there was a trend towards lower peritonitis uh, incidence in those uh, with incremental PD, suggesting that uh, incremental PD is a safe modality um, to start patients on peritoneal dialysis. Consequently, um, in order to maintain a lower PD dose as well as fewer exchanges uh, over a protracted period of time, it is therefore intuitive to preserve the residual kidney function uh, for as long as possible. Uh, in the recent ISPD guidelines, uh, we provided some suggestions on how this could be achieved, um, such as the use of RAS blocker with uh, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, um, the avoidance of nephrotoxic agents and contrasts unless clinically necessary, uh, and to maintain uvolemia and avoid uh, dehydration and chronic fluid overload states, and to achieve optimal blood pressure control and avoid episodes of hypotension and uncontrolled hypertension. I would now like to highlight the importance of applying the physiology of peritoneal dialysis, um, especially in patients who are using fewer exchanges, um, so that we could achieve uh, much better uh, solute clearance and ultrafiltration outcomes. So it is important for us to remember that peritoneal dialysis is extremely flexible um, as compared to hemodialysis, and there are many ways in which we can make adjustments to the prescription so as to achieve the desired solute clearance as well as the ultrafiltration volume um, that is needed for the patient. Um, and it is important that the PD physiology be taken into consideration uh, when we actually prescribe peritoneal dialysis for our patient. In the interest of time, I won't be able to dwell too much uh, into this um, area or go through the physiology of peritoneal dialysis, but I just want to highlight an example of how important that is. Um, so this is a case that is very common uh, in Philippines. Uh, and in Philippines, uh, the background to this is that um, the government reimbursed for only three bags of uh, PD solutions per day for patients. And therefore, um, when I do rounds in the Philippines, I always come across the prescription um, that is done in such a way that with three bags, uh, patients are given an average dwell time of eight hours per bag. And if you look at the chart on the right, where it looks at the, where it shows the ultrafiltration profile, um, patients who are receiving long dwells uh, inevitably will end up having reduced ultrafiltration or worse may even absorb the fluid from the PD solution. So if you look at uh, this example, where patients are uh, given three bags were given uh, eight hours exchange, you will notice that the ultrafiltration profile is less than desirable and that patients on the long dwell times uh, ended up absorbing the fluids uh, and become in positive fluid balance and actually increasing their risk of them uh, coming in with fluid overload. And indeed, I have noticed that many patients uh, presented with fluid overload uh, almost immediately after starting peritoneal dialysis. And many of the young fellows do not realize that this is really not due to fluid or salt indiscretion by the patient, but uh, it was an inappropriate PD prescription with uh, too prolonged a dwell time that is causing them to be fluid overloaded. Um, so we have sat down with them to actually uh, review uh, the prescription for uh, patients who are starting a peritoneal dialysis. And we have uh, showed them that uh, ultrafiltration could be optimized uh, with shorter dwell time for those who are using a lower tonicity or even a lower dwell volume. Uh, we have also suggested that for some patients with good residual kidney function, they may not require uh, an overnight dwell and hence the patient could be kept up and have a dry night. Um, and with that, um, uh, the ultrafiltration of the patients began to improve and we started to see uh, much better outcomes for patients started on peritoneal dialysis. So the reason why the fellows in the Philippines uh, have been putting patients on 8 hourly dwell and, and not uh, have a dry night is because the cost of a drainage bag is too prohibitive. Um, and so in the recent ISPD recommendations, we have also uh, proposed a solution to, uh, to overcome the need uh, for using a drainage bag. So in the last exchange, 
uh, we will ask the patient to perform the exchange as usual. They will drain the existing uh, fluid in the peritoneal cavity from the previous exchange. Thereafter, they will then fill uh, the peritoneal cavity with the new bag. But instead of this connecting, we actually tell the patient to keep the connection on and to clamp both tubings of the twin bag system. The patients can uh, spend the next two to four hours, depending on the dwell time, um, doing what they need to. However, they will be connected to the twin bag. And when it's time to do the drainage, what they will do is that they will invert the original fill bag so that this now becomes a drainage bag and allow the, the current fluid in the peritoneal cavity to drain. And thereafter, they could then disconnect the catheter from the twin bag system. So this um, allows the patients to avoid the use of a drainage bag, um, though it's a little bit more inconvenient that at the last exchange, they will need to be connected to the twin bag system uh, throughout the period of the dwell. And finally, we will now move on to what are some of the low cost measures that we can uh, use for our patients. Uh, before uh, we need to intensify uh, the PD prescription. Um, again, this is uh, listed in the recent ISPD recommendations, um, and we actually uh, articulated that greater emphasis uh, be made to utilize low-cost adjunctive management strategies in lower and middle-income countries, such as dietary and lifestyle modification, um, so that uh, we do not need to intensify the PD prescription prematurely. And such measures could include the following, such as a salt and fluid restriction, um, the use of high-dose diuretics for natriuresis, uh, the adoption of low-protein diet to lessen the generation of uremic toxins, um, but yet uh, try to avoid malnutrition. And of course, exercising uh, will help to increase uh, the insensible fluid loss. So therefore, uh, we always highlight this to some of the fellows um, in the lower middle countries that uh, intensifying the PD prescription uh, should never be the first option and these low cost measures should be utilized first. So um, to summarize, so maintaining patients on peritoneal dialysis is important in ensuring sustainable access to renal replacement therapy in many countries, especially in low resource settings. Um, cost savings must be balanced by the delivery of high quality and patient-centered peritoneal dialysis. Um, so these can be achieved by the use of incremental PD, which allows the stretching of the dialysis dollar, while the preservation of residual kidney function enables um, the stretching of the dialysis time. Now, optimization of the solute clearance and ultrafiltration may be achieved uh, through the flexibility of the PD prescription and understanding of the PD physiology and low-cost adjunctive management strategies should be considered first before intensifying the PD prescription. Um, so this is my contact, so feel free to email me if you have any questions. So thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Adrian, for the brilliant talk. There's a question that's in the Q&A about the role of the PET test. Do you want to say something about, about that? Um, for both monitoring patients and in, um, is, is, is it cost effective in lower in, in income countries? Yeah, so I, I think what we have uh, put forward is that um, the PET test and the KT over V um, can be done if uh, the cost of doing it is not going to compromise um, the ability for the patient to carry on to, with PD because uh, there are uh, countries, for example, in Vietnam, where if you do a PET test and a KT over V, the amount of money that is spent there equates to about 60 over bags of PD solutions and allows the patients to carry on PD for an additional uh, two to three weeks. Um, so we, we have actually suggested that, um, that PET test um, and KT over V be done only if it's not uh, going to affect the, the patient's ability to carry on PD. Um, but if it's extremely costly, um, then um, some of the measures that uh, Dr. Kiran has mentioned um, has been suggested to be used as monitoring um, tools for um, the ability, uh, for, for whether the patient is adequately dialyzed, including the symptoms and some of the simple biochemistry, which is uh, much cheaper than uh, performing the KTOV or the PET test. 
Um, I personally, even in my own practice, don't really um, do the PET test because uh, the transport status uh, could easily be obtained from a lot of the clinical features um, from the ultrafiltration profile as well as the biochemistry. Um, and, and I only do it in um, certain patients where um, it's, it's uh, where the PET test may provide some clues um, or if the clinical picture is not very consistent with what um, you think the patient um, is, is having. So, so that's kind of a, a, a summary. Um, it, it, the, the summary of it is um, do it if it's not going to compromise, but um, if it is, then there are much better uh, methods of monitoring the patient. Edwina, can I just add something to that? I mean, I think I agree with everything that was said, but in truth, you don't really need to measure a KT to V. If someone's doing three or four exchanges a day, dialysate plasma ratios will be between 0.9 and 1, even in patients who are low transporters. So you can estimate what the K to V would be simply by knowing the volume of fluid which is drained and assuming the dialysate plasma ratio was somewhere between 0.9 and 1. And had you done that in the case which was presented, for example, the numbers would have come out exactly the same, so. Yes, and I think we've all learned during the, this COVID time when we try and keep patients away from the unit as, as much as possible that you can manage PD patients without regular blood tests and without, um, certainly without clearance tests. So we, we're doing blood tests now every two to three to four months, um, depending on whether patients really you know, if they're anxious about coming up to the unit, we don't drag them up and tell them they have to have a blood test. And, and we certainly aren't, aren't doing clearance tests um, or, and certainly not doing PET tests. We're making clinical decisions about changes to, to dialysis prescription. In that particular patient that, uh, Karen, you uh, presented, uh, the KTORV of 1.4, was, was it just the KTORV uh, it was a combined residual renal function or, or just uh... so it was easy he he was aneuric by then oh time. he got aneuric okay yeah. but that's that's yeah. where i think that we we get into trouble whenever the patients become aneuric then it's hard to kind of uh, get a proper dialysis uh, in that in that patient uh, he was getting four exchanges what do you think was going on that he was continually getting more like a uh, the albumin was going down and everything was uh, going in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, so uh, the thing I thought that um, might be contributing, so I checked his uh, fluid for a TLC count and he had an infection, even though the family was saying that he's fine, everything is fine, the fluid is clear. Yeah. He had an infection at that time and that worsened his Parkinsonism as well. Probably, yeah. And I think that we, we need to remember, yes, it can be difficult to achieve adequate um, or, or good small solute removal in people who are aneuric. Um, in, in higher income countries, you can switch people to APD and get higher yeah. the volume of fluid. But equally, in a lower resource income country, if you're going to switch somebody to hemodialysis, they would be getting hemodialysis twice yeah. a week, once a week. And, and that is still going to be less dialysis than what you're getting with four exchanges on peritoneal dialysis. So. Yeah, I agree with that. That's what I tell my patients. You can't compare twice a week dialysis with PD. You're, you cannot compare adequate dialysis with inadequate dialysis. So if you have to compare the costs or the quality of life, you have to do it, uh, compare it with three times uh, hemodialysis. Um, yeah, and could, could I just check um, what the colors of the bags mean? Uh, what's a green bag and what's a red bag? Um, so, yes. Uh, so, uh, 1.5 percent dextrose is a yellow bag, um, 2.3 uh, percent in Fresenius, and 2.5 percent in um, Baxter is a green bag, and the red bag is a 4.25, and a purple yeah. bag is icodextran, which we don't have here. At, but uh, the other point I want to make is that I'm um, also amazed that you get very good ultrafiltration um, of two liters per day. Um, and so yeah. if, if you think about it, if you convert the patient 
to hemodialysis. Um, and even if you do three times a, a day, your ultrafiltration are from PD of two liters per day, that's about 14 liters a week. Um, it's, it's as good as any ultrafiltration you're gonna get on hemodialysis three times a day. Yeah, so. Hmm. Um, in well, patients, again, uh, so, so I just have a, a very strong question. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so, so the thing is that when you were describing incremental PD, so let, uh, Pakistan being a resource limited country, hmm. when you say incremental, does that mean that we're starting off with three exchanges or would you put the minimum at two uh, bags? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really going to be um, uh, patient directed. I mean, if you have very, very good residual kidney function, I mean, for this patient that Kiran presented, uh, you, you know, so if it has based on the presentations, this normal urine output, uh, we do not know what that means. But, um, you know, you, you could always start with one or two exchanges per day, rather than just anything short of four. And then you just work it up accordingly. And and it's not just the fact that you could do it incremental, but you could also, um, so, so we have had some patients where, um, because like, for example, uh, I, I have a lot more experience in the Philippines and Indonesia. In Philippines, they reimburse for three bags a day. And what we sometimes did was to allow the patients, so you get three times seven, 21 bags a week, you could do four exchanges for some days, and then you can give the patient a, a PD holiday on the weekend, and, and so we mix and match. So uh, while incremental PD is the concept where you increase the dose, um, it also must take into account that you could also be flexible and mix and match. Um, and, and so it's just not starting as a fixed three bags per day exchange or fixed four bags per day exchange. Um, and you really look at the patients, what is the clinical state of the patients, what you're trying to achieve, um, what's the residual kidney function, and then you start low and then work your way up. Yeah, and, and are they working? I mean, you can also do it so that they do less exchanges in the days that they're working and more exchanges, you know, at the weekend. Uh, I also find that by starting people on lower prescriptions, it makes PD a more acceptable uh, dialysis modality. Because to go from yeah. zero dialysis to suddenly having to do four exchanges a day um, seven days a week is, is a psychological blow. Um, whereas if you're just going starting on two or three exchanges and having a day off, um, e even if it's only for two or three months, that's still a, a stepping stone um, to, to, to the, which makes it much easier for the patient. So uh, let me just add to that, that if, for example, if we start someone on PD, we measure a K to a V from the urine what the residual renal function is. Yeah. If that one, for example, we'll start patients on two exchanges a day because in, in an average size male, um, two exchanges a day will contribute a K to V around 0 0.7 with a long dwell exchange, the dialysate plasma will completely equilibrate. So if they have a residual renal function where the K to V is one, two exchanges a day will easily get them up towards to 1.7. But I think the point that Dweener and Adrian made, uh, being flexible about some days off, for example, work days off, weekends off, works equally well, and it gives the patient a lot more flexibility. But two exchanges, if they do one in the morning when they get up and one in the evening when they go into bed, is very, very a very simple regimen to follow. One, one question that I have, uh, that membrane failure, I mean, which is also seen uh, at different uh, uh, like uh, time, uh, when patients on, are on PD. Do you just, I mean, in a uh, low-income uh, countries like Pakistan, would you just diagnose it based on like doing a 4% or 4.25% dwell for four hours and see how the UF is and, and then just uh, see if the membrane is failing? Yes, I mean, you can usually tell because ultrafiltration is disappearing that somebody's yeah. getting membrane failure. You don't need to do a PET test. It's as much a diagnosis as, as, as a doing a formal measurement. I think we need to move on if we're going to keep to the um, webinar timetable. Um, so I think there's another talk, isn't there, Miguel? Yeah, what? so today there's another talk by Professor Shafiq Chima, who will be talking on considering the hadron costs, the cost and availability of PD versus hemodialysis in Pakistan.
Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Shafiq Shima. I wish everyone Happy New Year. Uh, and I would like to thank ISPD for giving me the opportunity to share my experience about the cost and availability of peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis in Pakistan. I remember when I was a fellow in New York City around 2002, we only had uh, a six out of 200 uh, dialysis patients uh, on peritoneal dialysis. Uh, and then I was a medical director of several dialysis centers in Texas. I saw a significant increase around 2011 and 12 when there was a bundling of payment by Medicare. <clears throat> uh, and there were more incentives to the nephrologist. My point is a government's interest and incentives are important to make a difference. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, this article, which I found very interesting and relevant. It was published in 2013 in Nephrology, Dialysis and Transplantation about the cost of peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis across the world. Uh, similar background and objectives that peritoneal dialysis as a modality is underutilized, even though it could provide peritoneal dialysis and dialysis in the remotest locations. And it's more affordable uh, and have several advantages to be being the preferred modality, especially in the developing countries. And then, in the, and then in this article, they compare the cost of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, trying to prove that peritoneal dialysis is uh, at least as expensive as hemodialysis, if not less. So uh, a thorough literature survey between 92 to 2013, uh, having 78 articles across 46 countries, uh, 20 developed and 26 developing countries. Uh, the whole world was divided into six different regions and countries were placed into three categories based on the hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis cost ratio. Briefly, the results showed in North America, uh, that means in USA and Canada, hemodialysis is expensive as compared to peritoneal dialysis and peritoneal dialysis is cheaper. Uh, we are more interested in Asia and Middle East, uh, where the cost of hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis is almost the same, except Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Japan, uh, where hemodialysis is 20% cheaper, as opposed to Hong Kong, where hemodialysis is expensive and peritoneal dialysis is much cheaper. Uh, also, there was a difference in the penetration rate uh, for example, in most of the developing countries, including Pakistan, the penetration of PD is very low, and we are all aware of that. But the results showed uh, that most developed countries, hemodialysis was expensive, and most of the developing countries had either similar rate or peritoneal dialysis was more, more expensive. And also the cost could be brought down by local production and low import duties on PD solution and PD equipment. So these are the factors which affect the cost. For example, in Pakistan, uh, the cost is high because we are dependent on the imported PD solution by Fresenius. We have higher import duties and the government have no reimbursement policy. So let's move on to cost of hemodialysis in Pakistan. This is the cost of hemodialysis procedure only. At most of the private hospital, if you are performing 13 treatments and one dialysis cost around 5,000 rupees, it comes out to around $400 per month. Some centers have little bit higher, but overall this is the standard rate. There are some economical unsupervised hemodialysis center where the monthly cost would be for thrice weekly hemodialysis around $285. And if you're doing bi-weekly hemodialysis, which is not uncommon, it could be 175. Most of the public hospital provide it for free, but there is a long waiting list. I calculated the cost to the hospital to provide a hemodialysis, and that comes out to around $200 uh, per month. If you look at the cost of peritoneal dialysis, one exchange would cost this much rupees and $127 per month. Uh, this is utilizing imported for seniors two liter bags. Two exchanges would cost this and three exchanges would cost around 300 
81 dollar india is producing it locally and uh, the cost for three exchanges to them is around 271 dollar and if you're doing five exchange, four exchanges it's around 500 dollars apd is mostly not available public hospital don't have availability of capd either uh, some charitable organization provide but only to very few patients so if you compare the cost of capd with hemodialysis now and if you compare the cost of two exchanges of imported for seniors pd fluid with hemodialysis at a standard rate the hemodialysis is obviously uh, more expensive but at three exchanges it's comparable if you're doing four capd exchanges then pd would be more expensive Moving forward, if in the future we could produce fluid locally and do the three exchanges for 1500 rupees rather than 2000, the cost would be similar to India, $281. And hemodialysis would, would be much more expensive as compared to peritoneal dialysis. Even more economical uh, hemodialysis, with more economical hemodialysis, this PD would be comparable. So I found this uh, another systemic review uh, of the cost of dialysis in low and middle income countries very useful. Uh, based on what we just discussed, the annual cost uh, for three exchanges would be uh, around this, uh, and for four exchanges around six thousand dollars in 2020 in Pakistan, and this is still lower than Sudan, Bangladesh, Egypt, Sri Lanka, and China, and this cost is calculated in 2012 and maybe slightly higher than India. Uh, so we could conclude that CAPD three exchanges in Pakistan is cheaper than thrice weekly standard hemodialysis cost, and it's least in the region CAPD cost. So my take on this is uh, real value is probably uh, not the cost. So why I think cost is not the big issue or not the only barrier because CAPD cost is lowest in the region hemodialysis versus CAPD cost is comparable in Pakistan. Uh, if maintenance hemodialysis patient can spend around $400 in hemodialysis, then why can't he spend around $380 on CAPD? I recently switched three maintenance hemodialysis patient to COPD, CAPD after I made an awareness video and put it on my YouTube channel. We at Janab provide free PD solution catheter placement and have less than 10 patients after starting this program two years ago, meaning there are other factors which come into play, not just the cost. And most of our transplant patients spend around $400 per month on immunosuppressants. They could easily spend similar amount on PD too. So in order to look for uh, how our nephrologists think about it and what is their attitude towards CAPD in Pakistan, I did a short survey trying to find out what could be the other factors. So 48 out of 120 nephrologists in the group responded and a pretty good mix of trainers and trainees and some private consultants. Uh, when asked about uh, training in CAPD, 81% were are being trained in CAPD. Uh, only 41% were comfortable though in performing or supervising a CAPD program and 50% some were somewhat comfortable. When asked about uh, what would they offer if there are no contraindication to either modality, 43% uh, selected hemo and 56% selected CAPD. Availability of CAPD at the center or practice site, um, almost 60% have no availability, only 40% have availability. And when asked about the cost, 56% thought CAPD three exchanges is expensive than, than maintenance hemodialysis. It's actually $20 cheaper. Uh, about urgent start PD, only 41% had ever started urgent start peritoneal dialysis. And how likely uh, they would start their patient or initiate the hemo uh, peri uh, dialysis with peritoneal dialysis if offered completely free. So almost 88% would start CAPD, which is very interesting. So we could conclude that majority trained, but less than 50% are comfortable. Uh, there was a misconception that three exchanges of CAPD is expensive than hemodialysis. 60% 60, 60 centers have no availability of CAPD at practice site. And 60% have not performed urgent start PD. 88% will provide if provided free of cost, even though my experience is a little bit different and I'll come to that. 
so looking into the cost comparison of cost and this attitude of nephrologist uh, towards uh, a CAPD in Pakistan uh, after practicing for five years in Pakistan uh, my take on what we could do moving forward in order to promote peritoneal dialysis in Pakistan would be obviously we need, need to work on the cost and we need to decrease it by local production decrease the import duties and we need government support also we need to emphasize at the same time on the training especially training uh, young doctors and fellows and nurses we also need to increase awareness among public doctors and health sector because that could make a difference easy availability in private and public sector would help something like pd first public program like thailand might make a difference and then we must incentivize and punish nephrologist and program i remember in usa there was a 22 to 24 percent percent increase in peritoneal dialysis patient after bundling of payment and incentives uh, keeping the cost of ed still lower than hemodialysis and we could also punish the nephrology star program our fellowship certification program have to have it should be a compulsory uh, for a program to be certified that they have to have a CAPD program and then program director should make sure their fellows train at least one patient every year if not every month and then inexpensive uh, locally made cycler for APD uh, would help by increasing the choices uh, especially for those patients who are aneuric uh, and high transporter and also would lead to more chances of locally fluid production so i created a mnemonic to promote capd in pakistan and that mnemonic is capd so we need to work on the cost and cycler increase the awareness and availability uh, we need to have a punish and reward system more emphasis on training programs uh, and then on daily basis when we see new patient we need to give them all the options uh, including peritoneal dialysis and this is my take on this we must defeat that inertia that lack of motivation because i personally think a belief and passion for peritoneal dialysis uh, are fountainhead and uh, cornerstone on which a quality peritoneal uh, dialysis programs could be developed uh, if we could deal with the uh, covid much better than uh, so many other western and rich countries why can't we do this with that i thank you everyone for listening to me thank you and thanks for that. um it was a, a very provocative um presentation um and, and, and really i think it should be open to you know local nephrologists in pakistan to make comments and see how can you know what do they think about getting over i, I loved the new morning um, yeah, yeah, excellent presentation, by the way, Shafi. Yeah. Thank um, you. Uh, over the inertia. I can tell yeah. you what got over the inertia in this country, or in least my own unit, and and that was COVID. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, but 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 even before COVID, there was a drive for increasing home dialysis. Um, <clears throat> And, and we all know that the uh, investment, it's all like upfront investment. If you want to put patient on PD, uh, hemo is like just a, like a knee jerk reaction. So that's another reason many, many nephrologists uh, shy away. You know, basically what I was trying to say, um, that even though I was, I was not yeah. trained well in PD during my fellowship program, but when it was, you know, um, then we have to do it, uh, like in 2012 and uh, around 11. So we did so many things and you kind of uh, uh, learn it. And uh, we had like almost 30 patients in a year or so. So uh, to me, like in our center at, at uh, Jinnah Hospital, I think it's just the inertia because it takes much more time and effort and energy and talking to the patient and having... Uh, like you don't have a surgeon, everything is not set up for you. Versus hemodialysis, you just tell, the, tell your fellow and they just do it right away. They put a uh, hemodialysis catheter, arrange for a fistula, you start uh, hemodialysis. But PD, you have to be 
basically on top of everything because this is a uh, such a new thing for so many fellows and uh, these webinars are making a difference by by increasing the awareness so to me it it it's just inertia even if uh, like we're just talking about cost 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 it's just one factor uh, believe me the 88% who said that they would do it for uh, if it's provided completely free they'll do it for their patient we were unable to do it so it's not that easy it's training and so many other things come into play so that was just my take on this if we want to do it we could do it but we are just like uh, probably you know not willing to do it so well, when there is a will uh, there is a way both sides you are working on educating the public also shafiq and that is very very important because uh, the myths uh, associated with pds have to be uh, removed The other thing like I was an old lady. She's on. There was an old lady. She was on hemodialysis for like um, three years. She has uh, like she's almost you know not an uric but all in uric. She has two three hundred cc of urine output, and I recently switched her from hemo to PD because she live in a remote area, and that area is almost like hundred uh, miles away from the dialysis center, and she has been doing it. Uh, and she has been doing doing a great job only three exchanges even though she did not have a great residual renal function but yeah. she is uh, having you know good numbers and bicarb and albumin and urea and creatinine and she is having a better quality of life i think as compared to traveling every other day to a center and then coming back and feeling exhausted and tired with this fog and all that in the country it's not easy to travel i did not go through all the hidden costs because of the shortage of time but there are so many other advantages which we are all aware of yeah so, so, you you've traveled a lot and seen pd grown both you and and adrian it'd be useful to have comments from both of you about how you can see countries getting over this period of inertia um and being able to engage um both nephrologists and government in in switching to having more pd well I, for, first i think your talk was fabulous you covered things really extremely well so i i think you know public the public needs to be motivated and and the public needs to be um energized if you will to campaign to the government to expand to expand the way they reimburse dialysis resources and provide support for dialysis resources and i think your point about getting the nephrologist on board to support the public as the government is um um you know approach to expand these the uh, coverage which they provide for pd is critically important but i think the point you made about hidden costs you just made is really very important if you look at the cost to the individual patient transportation to dialysis facilities in many many low resource countries can really be substantial and the, they lost the ability to work because they spent so much time traveling back and forth to dialysis facilities so on a cost basis think what the cost the impact of the dialysis is the individual patient those hidden costs become extremely important and the cost of building dialysis units hemodialysis units is actually very expensive and is not often figured into the um the cost um of of the treatment itself which can be low because wages are low and you can buy dialyzers very inexpensively now um but if the government and the and patients want to expand services around the country to lower resource countries for example in Kashmir where we went with Kumar um last year i mean building hemo units in that area is going to be extremely difficult it makes much more sense to expand pd um in terms of these hidden costs for patients as well as the cost of actually constructing facilities so i think it's energizing the nephrology community energizing patients to approach the government to make have the government change its policies is critically important and media also as uh, shafiq is uh, dr kim is uh, utilizing media because charitable organizations in pakistan they contribute quite a bit uh, to the dialysis uh, uh, these dialysis patients so we can convince them we can convince the patient and we can convince the government now i know who is going to go with me beside ah then 
Dr. Noman and uh, maybe Dr. Muneev mm -hmm. and Kiran uh, to the government to convince them because we have to talk to the government uh, because once government gets behind this uh, this PD, then, then it, it will be a game changer. I know producing PD in Pakistan is important, but I think getting support from government and, and uh, organizations is even more important. The other thing I want to highlight that uh, regarding uh, Professor Chima uh, talk, that the policymakers in Pakistan, they are uh, in a view that PD is more expensive than hemodialysis. They didn't know the hidden costs or the, what the ISPD guidelines say, the other head, head, heads, like transportation, the, the when patient moved to dialysis center, hemodialysis center, they accompany two, three percent in their tradition, they, are, they have to take a meal, and then the more hospitalization of hemodialysis. So these hidden costs will added on to the Professor Jima uh, presentation, the cost will be low, more low, uh, lower in uh, PD than hemodialysis. So we need to um, make understand these policymakers that PD is very, very convenient and very suited to our populations because we are 202 to 220 million people and very large country. And also we are, whole Afghanistan is depending on you, especially in my province. So, so, so that's why we, we have to have good presentation that the PD will be much more cheaper and more uh, convenient for our population. Not uh, only that, in Pakistan, uh, hepatitis C is second only to China. It's a pandemic. Mm. And uh, it's not surprise, but zero conversion rate is much higher as compared to the Western countries. So given the COVID hepatitis C and B, PD could make a difference in basically decreasing the risk of all these infections. Yeah, and, and I think that COVID is the best thing that has happened to PD so far. And it's, it's, I don't think it should be an opportunity that we should just uh, let go. And this will be the best time. Um, but I, I think the other challenge uh, that I see in a lot of the low middle income country is that uh, unfamiliarity with PD. Uh, your young nephrology fellows have no one to look up to. Um, they, they have very little exposure to PD. And, and I think that, that uh, it's be, because at the end of it, uh, whatever that happens after that, you would still require the nephrologist to convince the patient. And a lot of patients will listen to the nephrologist um, in low and middle income country. And that's just one of the other things that I think uh, is important. Uh, where, when we go, we do try to identify young people um, who are passionate, uh, who are energetic, and we try to get them involved, uh, give them a lot of airtime in, for example, this kind of educational webinar. Um, and so that give them the opportunity to be able to present. And so that gets them excited. And, 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 and it's an important step in trying to get the nephrology community, uh, community to get involved in PD. And I would add that representing ISPD that if you do identify some young potential champions for per peritoneal dialysis, apart from webinars, we can offer them a scholarship to spend two to three months at, a, at an established PD clinic. And we, there's actually precedent for a model in which the physician and a nurse together will go to a, a center and learn how to implement peritoneal dialysis as a team. And I think that could be very useful. And all you need to do is go to the ISPD website, look under, I think it's scholarships or fellowships or awards. I don't remember the exact one. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up when we, when we digress for a minute here and come back and tell you the exact heading and have them apply for an award. I just want to request one thing, like uh, in new ISPD guidelines, these guidelines it is more low economic in country friendly now. And the other thing, the two companies, major countries, like Baxter Fizzness, they are uh, providing the all this stuff for PD. But you know, the when we get, we are more, of, I, I was, I work in uh, Singapore in a Baxter friendly uh, CPD. And then here we are doing a Fizzness. So when the patient I get from uh, other countries who are on Baxter based PD, so I have to change the, you know, the lure lock for the to connection of the bags. So I think ISPD, what can they do? They just advise or they just suggest to the Baxter physicians to do a uniform type of uh, connectivity system. So we can use uh, uh, 
both this <laughs> so will not have any difficulty for connectivity. I, I think that would be wonderful, but I suspect the companies are not going to agree with connectivity. <laughs> sort of, it's like a mobile phone thing, or yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and Apple versus Samsung. <laughs> you're, you're locked into their system. I mean, the other thing, but this is, is not in Hindu dialect. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we we have a fair number of patients from Pakistan, you know, Pakistan people in London who are on peritoneal dialysis. And they choose peritoneal dialysis so they can go back to Pakistan. Um, and I mean, during normal times, obviously not at the moment, I always have at least one or two of my patients in Pakistan on peritoneal dialysis. And, and, and that seems to be, I mean, if they were willing, would there then be a system say, for them to talk to patient charities? be interviewed by local journalists um, or, or something about the merits of peritoneal analysis. Um, you know, how is it, is it, what their life is like and, and how they've been enabled to travel to Pakistan because they're on that treatment. And, and, and then people wouldn't see it as, as a second rate treatment. This is something that people in Western countries are using. So in, uh, if I may, just it's ispd.org. The topic is apply slash nominate, and then their drop down is scholarship slash awards. Thanks, Isaac. Dr. Kershi, you were wanting to say something. Uh, yeah, um, I wanted to say that in, in our case, in our center, it, it has been the word of mouth of the patients who've been on PD, and that's made our uh, program successful. It's not uh, advertising or anything else. It's the word of mouth from patients who've been on PD, and then they've talked to their relatives or they, they've visited their hemodialysis, and then a few other people, after seeing them, how well they're doing on PD, have converted to PD as well. So currently, want... we're trying to print something uh, like patient experiences in uh, journals and so that more people are aware of this modality in Pakistan. But I think uh, another thing we uh, uh, videos that that are really uh, goes beyond word of mouth and and it, it spreads like I mean if you have good videos good message then it it just spreads faster and to more people. And I think we need to also have a uh, something like chronic kidney disease uh, educational classes once they are in like stage five chronic kidney disease. We need to talk to them, giving them all the possible options. Uh, with our busy practice and limited time, uh, we don't end up spending much time with the patient. If you give me any patient an extra 10 minutes, I could convince anyone for PD. And it's easier to convince people in Pakistan as opposed to the common belief because they would give you the option, dog, you tell me uh, what I should be doing. So if, because it's very difficult to, spend 10, 15 minutes with one patient. So if we could have 10, 15, 20 patients all in CKD stage five, say GFR less than 15, and then we do something like this to them, giving them all the option. They could ask all the questions about vascular access, about peritoneal dialysis, about switching from one, one to another. That would make a big difference. All it takes is only 10 to 15 minutes of extra time and nephrology is being motivated. So there is nothing which could stop you uh, growing this program. I share my experience. I started PD in 2006 in a very remote uh, district of Khabar Bartunkhwa, Dera Smal Khan, which is deserted and bordering the Afghanistan. So the most important part is counseling. If you counsel and give the advantages and disorder, uh, PD and disorder hemodialysis, more than 80%, 90% people will agree for PD. It's a lot of papers on in it. So I chose a very young patient with, uh, with good result function because I starting the first time. So I don't want to see my uh, technique failure or the PD program failure. So I, st uh, I just choose good uh, young patients with good result function. I started with two changes uh, after discussion with George Ibrahim from South Indian, uh, South India, <laughs> they good program there. And then increase incrementally to three and four. At that time, the PD bags were very cheap. 
So I able to achieve more than 50 patients at that time. Wow, that, that's very impressive. So there's a comment here on the chat line that somebody is creating a locally manufactured APD device that's going to be coming to Pakistan. And what do the panelists think about it? My, my own comments are, is that APD is not always that straightforward, um, that it uses considerably more fluid um, and can therefore be more expensive. Uh, you're very dependent on, on an electric supply, um, which um, if, if the, your, the latest power cut that you had in Islamabad made even the um, British um, news um, in the last day or so. And, uh, and, and I, I don't think, you know, an APD machine, I mean, people like gizmos with flashing lights, but I think the beauty of PD is that it's simple yeah. um, and, and, and straightforward. Yeah. We are promoting PD as a machine-free uh, modality and, and then bringing machine, uh, I think it, it will come. There, there's no question about it that APD will be part of this whole uh, project in, in future. But, uh, yeah, but So what, what do people, I mean, how do you see, I mean, I'm not, I don't know making the APD machine. No, the, the, the thing is that the, uh, just sort of mm -hmm. uh, uh, brief the rest of the panelists, that the machine is already here because the machine has been used at our center. The Professor Numan Tarif has already used it. Probably oh. Dr. Kirsten has also used it at, at her center. I'm not sure if you've used it yet or not. No, 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 not yet. The machine is here. It's just, uh, I think it's awaiting um, regulatory approval. That is what needs to be done at the moment. So, so people are excited about it. And I think that the availability of the machine has stimulated the public a little bit as well, because I have received quite a few patients recently who have said that they've seen this machine being sort of advertised on various Facebook forums, probably. And they would want to try it because I think what they've sort of targeted is, is, is sort of a theme that bloodless dialysis. That is what they've, I think, gone with. And then lots of patients have come and said that we want to shift to that, but that's not available in the market yet. Um, and uh, because until and unless it does have approval of, of course, it won't be available to the general public yet, but initial results are quite promising. That's, that, that's my I think. Um, in, in, but is it more costly? Is, is it more costly than, you know, yeah. chemo or CAPD? So, so essentially, um, uh, I, I might not be able to answer that question right away because initially what the, 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 the manufacturers, what they said was that the, they would probably sort of make a, a package into it. So e eventually on the whole, it will be cheaper to uh, hemodialysis. I haven't looked into the economics of it, but that is what the selling point has to be. I think they're also looking at making some PD fluids of their own. So if they have that, that is going to, you know, make, be a game changer as far as <laughs> economics is concerned, probably. Um, and yeah. uh, if I may add here that uh, I think the importance of APD is, is not questionable because um, there are certain patients who will definitely require APD. So uh, it has to be there for, uh, as an alternative to, um, uh, to patients who require short exchanges overnight. They want to be free during the day, but yet they don't want to go to the hospital and uh, get the dialysis during their sleep time. Um, you know, that's just going to increase the choices because in Pakistan, there are certain, uh, you know, percentage of uh, patients and people who could afford any cost. So it's not like everybody would not be able to afford and cost would not be issue for everyone. So I think it would just increase the choices. And then obviously, uh, as Dr. Noman said, there would be some patients for which it would uh, really be needed. Uh, I think our main focus is on CAPD, uh, but having that on board also as an option would not be a bad idea. And I was thinking, and I would need uh, an input from the experts, like in Pakistan, even in center, peritoneal dialysis on an APD or cycler would be something to consider as well because people would not mind coming to a center for six hours during the day and hooked up to this machine and uh, not see blood and all that and just get uh, peritoneal dialysis and go home and then they are free because I know the flexibility and so many options and innovations could make a difference and I was thinking uh, there would be a set of patients who would be interested in something like this. 
so if we want to increase the options to as many as possible uh, i think that would be a good addition uh, but not the ultimate solution hopefully that would just increase our options and i think uh, we are excited and uh, looking up to that the other thing to for a sustainable pd program we need to involve some ngos and also insurance uh, companies you know like in all uh, developed countries singapore hong kong and other countries the insurance uh, play an important role even for apd if you have got an insurance company they can rent this uh, uh, apd cycler to patient they can the plan and they can do it at home on home basis so we need to have like in pakistan sehat in soft card now the government have uh, uh, issued this uh, for this purposes and insurance companies covering it in india this their successful bd uh, program especially in south india insurance companies doing it and they give a full package uh, after calculating life expectancies and uh, entering the patient and then give a package for full package till uh, the pd program uh, till the TD, pd technique is uh, going on with the patient and they give a full package of uh, three to four exchanges per day Okay, so I, I think that's been a fantastic discussion and it's really exciting that there are new developments that are taking place. I think we should move on to wrapping up the webinar and we're um, going to hear from Professor um, Tarif about lessons learned and the way forward. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Advina. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience, I think, so far. And how wonderful, you know, when you listen to all these uh, uh, sharing of the ideas and, uh, and uh, look at that, you know, how much flexibility is there. Um, if you look at peritoneal dialysis, so what do you see here? You know, you can do two exchanges, one exchanges, three exchanges. You can change according to the physiology, as was uh, very rightly mentioned. Uh, you know, you can just uh, make sure that you get the right amount of uh, adequacy as well as at the same time you get you know the ultrafiltration so there is a combination of all these things one can always tailor to the patient's needs and that will be very cost effective uh, the uh, unfamiliarity of uh, the uh, the peritoneal dialysis uh, within the uh, within the training programs is is there yeah is this is this still there because as was mentioned, uh, only four or uh, three programs are there in whole Pakistan. So I think we need to increase this uh, this number uh, to uh, to a larger scale in different uh, parts of Pakistan, so that at least we have at least one, two, or three patients. So that if when we have more experience, we'll have more patients, and you know uh, the learning will be there. As far as uh, the cost is concerned, there's no doubt whenever the government is there, it is going to improve the statistics, just like happened in uh, Thailand and Hong Kong. However, um, I, that just reminds me of one of my patients about uh, uh, 10 years ago almost. And uh, uh, she was a patient who had lost all her uh, vascular excess and she was started on peritoneal dialysis. So I was at that time in one of the government hospitals, services hospital. and. Uh, so when um, uh, she was going to be discharged, it became a big uh, question, you know, how to support her peritoneal dialysis. Someone supported for some time. And then ultimately her brother, he was able to get fund from one of the organization, which is there. And it's a huge organization in Pakistan in all the provinces. And that is Bethel Mal. And he got it approved from the Bethel Mal and she got the dialysis solutions four exchanges per day for the whole, you know, two or three years that she lived uh, on peritoneal dialysis. So I think if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, there are a lot of funding agencies in uh, Pakistan where uh, within the government system, you can get help. I think uh, we should look uh, and explore all these avenues. As was mentioned about the uh, insurance uh, uh, companies. I don't know uh, what's happening in Islam. Islamabad, but one of my patients uh, uh, who was in peritoneal dialysis and uh, he got uh, supported from one of the insurance company and they supported fully for the peritoneal dialysis. And so we asked this, uh, the company to support uh, uh, for the other patients. 
but somehow you know they just backed out so there is some lag here and there but i think uh, by increasing the number of uh, patients by getting the advocacy groups where we can ask the uh, the insurance companies and uh, probably educate them and similarly the government and this will all uh, going to help us uh, improve our statistics i think uh, uh, as um, uh, the ispd and isn um and all the people in within the uh, the peritoneal dialysis community internationally are helping us and uh, it was wonderful to see that there was a physician uh, and uh, assistant or nurse uh, program a scholarship there uh, which is a wonderful thing and i think uh, some of our centers uh, will benefit quite a lot and uh, i would urge uh, our uh, colleagues to join the ispd and increase the numbers so that you know we will have some voice within the ispd and further support from the ispd i think ispd has done quite a lot so far and uh, as one of the famous quote i would just change it a uh, change it to my own words uh, by i think it was from kennedy ask not what ispd is going to do for you ask what you can do for the pd now <laughs> i think this is a time a high time that we should just uh, move forward and uh, start exploring these things thank you very much well, well thank you i've been, enjoyed these um two webinars immensely seeing old friends from pakistan making new friends um i look forward immensely to us all being able to actually see each other face to face at some point maybe towards the end of this year um and definitely by the time the ispd meeting is in singapore which is in August 22 isn't isn't that right Adrian? Yeah, August 2022. Yeah. So definitely by then we should we should have a session about how um PD has grown um in in Asian countries. And and and, and just to mention in terms of membership of the ISPD this can be done as a group membership um through the Pakistan Society of Nephrology. Um and if you contact me um one of you contact me well um then he he can um put you in touch with the membership committee and and sort that out so i'm going to pass the um as it were the mantle onto um kamal for the absolutely last last few words okay sure well um uh, and hopefully i mean we'll have psn uh meeting uh, i'm not sure that when we are going to have a, a definite date but uh, that would be a time that we would love to have all of you to come and and visit pakistan so so i would like to uh, thank all of uh, the attendees and uh, the panelists uh, uh, for the time and uh, making these webinars a success and an important milestone i mean this 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 really is is a, i mean i shouldn't be uh, using big words but history i mean we are we are we are doing some things that we have never done before and uh, so i would like to thank international society of peritoneal dialysis uh, uh, for doing uh, all this uh, for us uh, migro uh, for helping and uh, keeping keeping us in line uh, uh, keeping this whole uh, program run smoothly uh, dr adrian liu uh, for attending and and sharing his experience and uh, uh, enlightening us uh, with with what they have been doing uh, in singapore and uh, dr isaac titlebaum and uh, for for being here and uh, giving us uh, 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 the valuable uh, input and last but not the least uh, uh, edwina craft and <laughs> fred finkelstein uh, i mean you guys are not a uh, uh, guest anymore i mean you are among us uh pakistan <laughs> we, we are thinking of giving you like honorary citizen <laughs> for pakistan <laughs> because That's there's true. a book, there's a book that i read long time ago it's, <laughs> the name of the book was three cups of tea so there's an uh, american who, who gets lost in the in the mountains and and he he becomes friends with the <laughs> local uh, kashmiri people and and then then they they he becomes so close to them that he gets the he gets offered the third cup of tea because he was like building schools there and doing a lot of things so the name of the book was third 
three cups of tea because the third cup is offered only to people who are among you among uh, <laughs> so you're you're not you're not any uh, any more any guests so so we would love to have you back and, and thank you again everybody and that that's that's uh, pretty much it uh, very exciting session and uh, thanks kiran and uh, shafiq for for a wonderful presentation Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. This was really wonderful, and I'm I'm glad to see how much PD is sort of expanding and growing, and the enthusiasm from everybody there. So, thank you guys very much. This was great. And, and on the webinar, thank you very much. Going on to the um, ISPD channel on YouTube for access to people to download or to look at it. Great. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.